I read, that's what I'm engaging with. I'm actually looking for the emotional shape of the story. There's and there's I like certain genres. I don't like other genres. And I realized what I'm saying there is I like specific emotional shapes. And there's other emotional shapes I don't like. So I don't connect with the emotional shapes that are common in erotica, for example. Or I don't connect with the emotional shapes that are common in sci-fi. But I do connect with the emotional shapes that are common in thriller. Right? Like so when we talk about genre, it's just another way to understand because the reader isn't coming to our book with like, oh my gosh, I love the horror tropes. They're coming to the book with like, oh my gosh, I love how this story how I engage with the story and how it makes me feel when I read it. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 312 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode, I have an interview with Jeff Elkins. Jeff Elkins coaches authors and podcasts as the dialogue doctor, focusing on helping authors on improving their dialogue and creating great voices and dynamic character interactions. He is also the author of 12 novels. We talk about his writing, his tips on dialogue, voice, and conflict, and so much more. And that's coming up later in this podcast. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you to get your audiobooks out into the global market of more than 43 retail and library channels. Findaway Voices is a subsidiary of Findaway, and Findaway is owned by Spotify. And in May of 2023, they announced that one of the distribution platforms that they send your audiobooks to, Spotify, (laughs) since they are part of the same company, they've waived the 20% distribution fee. This is a bit of an update on that. So, Great news for authors, Findaway Voices says. We are excited to announce that starting in May of 2023, there will be no 20% Findaway Voices distribution fee for audiobook royalties with Spotify. Findaway Voices' pricing structure for audiobook distribution is simple. It's an 80-20 share, where the author keeps 80% of their royalties. Now, the standard 80-20 pricing will remain for all their other partners, except for Spotify they're no longer charging a 20% distribution fee because they want to pass on the cost savings efficiency that are realized through their integration as part of the Spotify company because they're committed to helping authors reach a wide audience through retail and library partners that they choose to work with. Now, why should you care about no distribution fee on an author's Spotify earnings? Because Spotify now offers the highest royalty you can make selling your audiobook with Findaway Voices. When your audiobook is sold on Spotify, now you receive all of the 50% of the list price that you set. Authors can find a new audience on Spotify who recently announced that its global monthly active listeners are now 515 million strong. And one of the great tools for marketing your books that you get from Findaway Voices are giveaway codes, distribution giveaway codes for Spotify. You can give these out to your newsletter subscribers as a reward, and try to get some leverage and some visibility on Spotify. For example, when I look at my own dashboard, and I've given away plenty of Spotify codes for some of my audiobooks, either at in-person events or just in general for reviewers, etc. I can see right in my dashboard that I've gotten reviews and ratings on Spotify, which is great, and we all know how important ratings and reviews are. So, if you've been thinking about going wide with your audiobooks now, now is the time better than ever to find your new audience for audiobooks on Spotify. And if you're looking for more opportunities on how you can leave exclusivity 
and get your books wide. I'll have a link in the show notes at starkreflections.ca for this episode on a support article on how to leave exclusivity and how to promote your audiobooks. There'll also be a bonus link on how to promote your audiobooks from the BookBub blog for authors that was posted just this week. And this is the week of June 30th when this episode is going out, 2023, because one of the other platforms you can get to through Find Away Voices is Chirp Audiobooks, another great platform where you can get some promotions and visibility and get your audiobook into more listeners' ears. <laughs> so if you want to check out how you can leverage Findaway Voices, if you haven't already, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Before I do a brief personal update, I wanted to share some exciting news. I'm going to be doing some giveaways As mentioned in episode 310, which was an interview with Dana Clare, author and chief operating officer of Book Brush, I mentioned an opportunity for patrons to win a free complimentary ticket courtesy of Dana and BookmarkCon worth $199 US. BookmarkCon is a virtual conference. You can learn more about it over at episode 310. There'll be a link of course, in the show notes to that. And so patrons who are interested in winning one of these uh, three complimentary tickets, I, drew, I did the draw. I drew the names. And so I'm going to announce the winners of complimentary bookmark on tickets. And I have emailed the winners and uh, congratulations. So congratulations to the three winning patrons who won $199 ticket to bookmark on. Congratulations to Alyssa Curon. Sherry Dector Hurst and Malcolm Kuhn. Congratulations, Alyssa, Sherry, and Malcolm. I sent emails to you, so check your spam folders just in case they're in there. And I just wanted to confirm the email address to give to Bookmark On to send you your complimentary tickets. But I want to thank all of the patrons who support this podcast, of course. Thank you to all my awesome patrons. That's why I love doing prizes and random surprises for my awesome patrons. Uh, in addition to the bonus content that you can find over at patreon.com slash darkreflections. But I also did an interesting thing in the survey because it just felt like, you know, you know, enter your name, your email address, and do you want in? <laughs> and it just seemed like a sort of a you know, not a very robust survey. So I thought, oh, why don't I throw something in there for fun? So I did an informal optional element to the survey. People did not have to fill it out. They could just do the three fields and click and they're done. But everyone who entered participated in this informal survey of favorite pizza toppings. And so interestingly enough, among the patrons who entered their names, you know, for bookmark on tickets, the most popular topping was pepperoni at 37.5%, uh, followed by a tie between, and this is very controversial, a tie between mushroom and pineapple at 31.2% as the second most popular topping on pizza. <laughs> I'm in the pineapple camp, by the way. Onion, black olive ham, and sausage all tied for third place as favorite pizza topping. Now, I was I was surprised to see bacon bits uh, or chunks beat out bacon strips with twice as many people going for the chunks over the strips. And even, even anchovies made it on to the list. But, by the way, because everyone who entered participated in the informal pizza survey that I did for patrons... I decided I was going to throw in a bonus, so I drew, and and again, the drawing, by the way, I should mention is, uh, you know, I extract onto a spreadsheet, and then I do a random number, random number, a random.org, random number, and that's how I come up with the winners, so I decided to draw two runner-ups, who did not, unfortunately, win the $199 tickets, but because everyone shared what their favorite pizza topping was, two runner-ups in the random draw are getting pizza from the stark reflections podcast yay (laughs) so what i'm doing is i'm offering 25 dollars towards your favorite local pizza place so you can enjoy your favorite pizza and your favorite pizza toppings while supporting a local pizza business because we're supporting small business we are as independent authors and authors in general small business owners ourselves so we want to support other small businesses right so what i've done is i've emailed the winner's 
Uh, so you can let me know the name, website, phone number, whatever of your favorite local pizza place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to contact them and arrange a gift certificate for you, courtesy of the Stark Reflections podcast. And so the winners of the pizza, I have to go over to the spreadsheet, <laughs> grab the name. So the winner of the pizza are um, Kathy Mack. And Michael Howell. So, Kathy and Michael, look for emails in your inbox. Uh, I will be reaching out to you to find out where I can, where I can, um, you know, where I can buy you your favorite pizza. And again, and again, a special thank you to all the patrons who support this podcast over at patreoncom Reflections, where you'll see a chart because I had to do the, I had to do a chart on favorite pizza toppings from the entrance as well. And don't forget, don't forget if you are interested in book Marcon, it looks like a, a fantastic virtual conference where yes, you get more of me, but uh, everyone has an opportunity to save fifty dollars off your registration for bookmark on exclusively exclusively let's see if i can say exclusively exclusively for listeners of the stark reflections on writing and publishing podcast and so as as i did also announce in episode 310 all you have to do is go and register for that and use code mark 50 m-a-r-k five zero at checkout I would go with all caps. That's what that's what Dana sent me. Um, but check out Bookmarkon over at bookmarkon.com and you can use Mark50 to get $50 off the virtual conference. No travel. Get to do it from the comfort of your own home. Or, well, it's not usually as portable because it's video, but not, not, not quite as portable as the podcast where you can do from the comfort of whenever you want to listen. But that is it for the winners in terms of a very quick personal update i am up to my eyeballs in finalizing finishing off yippee kaye mother bleeper the uh, trivia book for die hard and it, again like working on the you know the canadian mounted for planes trains and automobiles it's just so much fun <laughs> i've gone back through rewatched the special features and and the uh, director's commentary on on the first movie because the book is is ninety percent about the first movie, but then I do have chapters and details about the franchise and some of the other movies. I just didn't. It would have been too big of a book to do all all of them, and I wanted to try to keep it. I'm trying to keep it under two hundred uh, pages, but going back through the the special features and stuff and pulling out more trivial tidbits and interesting details about one one of one of my favorite all-time Christmas movies. <laughs> Anyways, so that's been keeping me really busy. The travel that I did recently over to Sudbury Graphicon was absolutely phenomenal. So I did this on Saturday, June 24th, and my my sister Laura came and helped me with um, with the booth. So I had free labor there, um, although I do owe her a bottle of Bailey's. But I... I did over a thousand dollars in sales at the at this, and so the cool thing was was my accommodations were free. I basically had to pay for gas, I had to pay for the table, and of course I had to pay for the for the books I sold. Right, so uh, the books I got from a traditional publisher, I was only making a forty percent margin on, and then the books that I self published, um, the ones those are I'm making closer to sixty or seventy percent margin on. And so when I look at it, you know, when I look at the cost of the table and the cost of gas and stuff like that, okay, so I only made a few hundred dollars in profit, but it was a pretty extraordinary event. Uh, Sudbury's always been really good to me. I had some people who were fans of mine who had read Spooky Sudbury and didn't realize I had this, you know, series of fiction titles because the last time, the last time, 2019, when I was at Sudbury Graphicon, I didn't even have the Canadian Werewolf series. I had a Canadian Werewolf in New York as a standalone book, and it had a more literary-looking cover. It didn't even have the urban fantasy-esque cover that it has now, the fantastic cover from Juan Padron. I mean, I didn't have all six of the books in the series. And and so that was, that was a really awesome opportunity. I also had created some giveaway cards with Vista, Vistaprint, uh, the Canadian werewolf series and what i did is using book funnel i created a landing page where people could download a 10,000 word story this time around 
I had This Time Around, which is a 10,000 word short story that got readapted into the novel A Canadian Werewolf in New York. So it kind of becomes like the first several chapters of, of the book, uh, the early morning, the very first sort of mini adventure that Michael completes because he, you know, needs to get to his destination, his morning appointment. So 10,000 word story this time around in ebook, but also in audiobook. And, and that way, through Book Funnel, people could could go to that one landing page, download both of them, whatever. So it's just a great opportunity, and and I basically had the, I had these postcards from Vistaprint, and I had the landing page, from Book Funnel. I also created a little stand up card so people could scan the QR code and just grab it right on their phone. Like click, go to the QR code, go right there, and you can and you can get the free book with an option, of course, to um, signing up for my newsletter. And, and I, that was the first time I'd done something like that where I actually had that sort of easy giveaway. I even had um, ebook cards that I had made using book funnel codes, it, you know, unique codes. And I only did up, I think, 25 for each book. I didn't sell any of the ebooks because the people that were there were really wanted print books. But I had them there just, you know, I didn't even have them on display. I did have them on the sign that said, you know, the print book is $20, but the ebook is $6.99. And those are Canadian, by the way. So they're $4.99 in ebook, but $6.99 Canadian and $20 Canadian as well. They actually, I think they save a bit of money when they buy the books there. Cause I also, I do have to pay GST to the government. So I, I'm supposed to collect GST, but I just embed it in the price. It's easier to take a $20 bill and I just pay the 13% to the government. So that comes out of my cut, but it comes out of my margin and that's fine. That's all part of part of doing business, but that's it. Um, I'm going to cut a personal update because I just realized I'm going on 17 minutes. And what I really want is I really don't want to be doing a monologue. I really want to be doing a dialogue with Jeff Elkins, the dialogue doctor. And that's coming up right after this bumper. Dr. Elkins, welcome back to the Stark Reflections <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh, that's terrifying. Um, that's really funny. You know, I do feel a lot of like social pressure to go get a doctorate just to like earn the title that I've given yeah, to myself. Yeah, like in English or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like right now it's like an honorary. Actually, I will take whatever doctorate anybody gives me. An honorary. If, that would be nice from, from your alma mater, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Surely they know I exist. And, um, I know they know I exist because they're constantly sending me letters for money. So nice. I know they know I exist. We just now have to convince them that I deserve an honor. They know your, your your checkbook exists. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> if I can, you know how yeah, different organizations you can become an ordained minister or or whatever it is. I might see if if my Stark Publishing Empire can can decree doctorates if I have to become oh. sort of educational introduced. Awesome. Yeah. I, Mark, I will bow whatever knee I need to bow to get an honorary Stark <laughs> reflections doctorate. I'll do whatever I have to do. But yeah. okay. So if anyone who has not heard you on my podcast before or, or heard or been lucky enough to hear your podcast or on, on other podcasts, um, I'm joking because uh, Jeff's uh, pseudonym is the dialogue doctor because it is a specialty. Now, for those listeners, can you give a bit of a background on, I mean, who is Jeff Elkins? Who is Jeff Elkins, the writer? Who is Jeff Elkins, the dialogue coach? Do we want to go like really introspective? Because we could be here for hours. <laughs> That's um, right. Let's talk sorry, about this, your trauma. <laughs> this has just become my therapy session. Who is Jeff Elkins? Yeah, no. So I am, uh, I'm the author of, I've been writing nowhere near the 30 years that you have. Congratulations on 300 episodes, by the way. That oh, was, okay. um, what an incredible milestone. That was amazing. <laughs> you just sh shove a few extra episodes in every every few weeks, and then you get to 300 faster. You get to 300 real quick. I, I don't know, man. Don't minimize. Doing anything for five years is super impressive. Like, you know, I don't I don't think I've actually held one job for five years. So uh, it, usually around the five-year mark that I start to, my eye starts to wander. Yeah. <laughs> a new too. role, a new challenge. Uh, yeah, so I started nowhere near your 30 years in the industry. I started writing uh, about eight, eight or nine years ago. and That's, and that's that, still a long time when you think about the indie author uh, space, right? I feel old. I feel <laughs> like a, yeah. Um, I've seen people come and go, I think, which makes you feel old when like people show yeah. up and then you kind of look around and you're like, where did that person go? And you reach out to them and they're like, oh, yeah, I don't really 
writing maybe someday i don't really write anything anymore i'm like oh no Wow. A generation has passed that I'm still here. Um, so, so, <laughs> well, yeah, kids, I, let me tell you about what it was like. <laughs> <laughs> before before the AI started writing for us. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I've, and in that time, I've written 12 novels. Uh, I just had one come out in March that is a Ghostbusters meets The Office. Oh, that sounds hilarious. Horror comedy. It's, I really enjoyed it. I co write it with JP Ryan Flesh. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. JP's fantastic. And he, uh, and makes it funny because I tend to bend kind of dour. So he, like, he makes it entertaining. And what, what yeah. did you say it was called? Nerds, Nationally Recently Deceased Services. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, I've got to get that. I have got to get that. That sounds like a great read. Yeah. It's great. It started as a Vela. Uh, we started cranking it out. When Amazon Vela went live, we were like one of the first ones in, which is okay. always nice. And then, um, we just published. We just took the first season and published it in a single volume. So, oh, cool. the first season, sixty six episodes, sixty six okay. chapters, and we're about ten chapters into season two right now. On Vela. oh, that's a great. I, lo- I love the way that you're leveraging the uh, you know different ways that you can release, and also that this. Have you collaborated before on fiction, or is that the you've, you know you have collaborated on fiction, but most of your stuff is solo, isn't it? It is. Most of my stuff is solo. This is, my, I would say this is my first successful collaboration. Okay. I've collaborated. Um, my first series was a collaboration and um, my best friend and I wrote it together. We weren't really in the same place. Like we, we didn't know when we started because we, we were both starting out. We right. figured out real quick that like we had different motivations and drives for being authors. Right. So it wasn't, it wasn't a great collaboration. Like we still kind of write with it and toy with it. And we're still best friends. We just moved at different paces. We were both supposed to write. He was going to write the th- first three books in the series, and I was going to write the second three books in the series, and then we we're going to figure out the last three books in the series. And <laughs> while he was writing book one, I wrote four books. Oh, I see. So, <laughs> and so I was like, oh, we're moving. And I, by that point, I was like three years in, and I was like, oh, this is actually really important. Like the, how your drive, your motivation, how you work together is really important for a collaboration um so yeah. he um we still toy with it every once in a while but the series is kind of frozen right now while he finishes yeah. book three. Oh, well he's not he's on book three there you go yeah he's okay. he's gotten two out he's on book three okay he's slowly moving forward which is great and as soon as he's done we'll pick up the last three books because i love the series i don't want it to and usually the first one's the, the the harder one, right? Like once you get over that sort of first book hump, then then the rest of them seem to come. I'm- they seem to come. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes you get frozen. I got stuck. I've been doing about two a year. And then last year I got stuck on one novel that took me a whole year to do. Okay. So that can still yeah. happen then, yeah. Yeah, it just slowed it just slowed me down. I think it was very um it was more fictionalized memoir and I got very like emotionally trapped in the novel. Right. Okay. And so there's a lot of like, just a lot more resistance than what I usually write. Yeah, I think the book is better. It's I think it's one of my best books, but it was uh, it was just heavy, which is what authors are like, what readers are really looking for. They're really looking for a book where the author's like, "This is heavy. Yeah. Uh, so- <laughs> <laughs> this is going to bring you down. <laughs> this is going to bring you down. This is a bummer." <laughs> so yeah, that's my author journey. I uh, for my about 2020. I was looking for a way to re-engage with the author community. I had actually, it actually came from some advice from you because I was, I call, I don't know if you remember this at all. Like 2018, I reached out to you and I was like, Mark, my books aren't selling. You know, I don't, I don't, not the way I want them to. I can't seem to like focus on a genre. I'm all over the map. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And part of your advice was like, Hey, start engaging in the author community. Cause it's like, you're the only person I've ever talked to. So <laughs> you're like, try to start like engaging in people. So I did. And around 2020, I started looking to like, how do I, and that was ex- incredibly helpful advice. It really saved me as a writer. I think oh, wow. that if, if I hadn't of talked to you and had that moment of clarity with you, I think I probably would have let go of writing because i was at a pretty low place so whoa hello, really look at us getting all uh, i'm getting all the clamped now it's getting all serious. <laughs> yeah so that I was a... get a tissue but no wow that is that is fantastic because you've done i mean you've done great fiction but you've done so many great things for other writers too i mean i can't imagine the world without you doing the cool <laughs> things you do 
Thanks, man. And just know that you just partially took credit for whatever disaster I become. Oh, um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, yeah, so 2020, I was um, really looking for a way to give back to the author community. I was also looking for a way to, like, I just flat out needed more money. I needed more income. I had a kid going to college early. Financial struggles, like, early in my 20s and 30s had made it, like, oh, I gotta, I have to earn to right. get him to pay for his tuition. Oh, yeah. So I was talking to our mutual friend, Jay Thorne, and he was like, hey, take what you do professionally, because professionally, I, I'm a professional mimic who um, trains professionals in difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I lead the writing team for that training company. So he was like, hey, take what you do professionally and try to help authors with it by applying it to their writing. So the Dialogue Doctor was born. Um, that was like fall of 2020. We started doing, I started doing, I say we, because there's a couple people who do it with me now, but I started doing um, a podcast every week and uh, there's a newsletter that comes out, but I think the best thing has been, uh, I started working with authors in one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Yeah. And I'd say like, Hey, you send me, you know, 2000 to 6,000 words and I will analyze what you're doing in dialogue and we'll figure out how to um, strengthen your, uh, the tools you're using to empower you to write better dialogue. Since then, I've done uh, over 200 sessions since 20, since the fall of 2020 when I started wow. doing that. And they've been fantastic. I, it's really become a major joy in my life. I think I actually like helping other writers more than I like writing my own fiction, which is a weird thing to say. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with you. And it's dangerous because I do love helping other people and watching their success. Yeah. And then going, why, why don't I do some of the things I tell them to do? yeah i know right yeah i feel like every time so we saw i i take at the dialogue doctor community because there's a community who's kind of formed around what uh, i and um laura and jp are also both dialogue doctor editors now um so there's a community is formed around what we do and it is a problem solving community it's like people yeah. bring problems and we like work together to figure out like how to describe the problem, how to figure out a better solution for the problem, how to build tools and techniques around the problem. And I find that every time we solve a problem or we figure out a different technique, I want to like go rewrite all my old books. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like, oh, now I gotta, now I gotta go rewrite all of this. <laughs> uh, but I haven't yet. I have not done that. But so that's, um, but there, there is that definite danger. I think that, um, you know, and I, it, the community is really what I love. And the book that uh, is coming out in July 1st, The Dialogue Doctor Will See You Now, is a, we've taken, I've taken like the top eight problems that we've had to solve. Yeah. And I've, I've like described the solutions we found. Like, hey, here's the, yeah. here's what we've come up with as a community is like, this is how we solve this problem. So um, my hope is that this can be another way that authors can find connection with their dialogue. They can strengthen their dialogue to better connect with readers around what they're doing. Well, this is fantastic. Uh, it's funny when I saw that you had a book out, I thought you already have, but this is, I mean, I mean, you, you have, have had books on dialogue or, or shorter pieces that you've given away and, yeah. and you've been coaching and sharing. And I realized, no, this is a pretty exciting thing. It just felt because you've been so giving that I thought you already had something like this. So this is a, yeah, this, this is, is a first, awesome. this yeah. is a first, it's probably a first of multiple to come because there, I wasn't, I wanted to keep it short and usable. Yeah. Taking after other masters of writing author help books like yourself uh, and not like dump a Robert McKee, like tome on people. <laughs> I actually started writing it at one point and one of the dialoguers who is a brilliant editor in and of himself was like, Hey, cause in the community we'll be like, okay, so we're going to use this technique. And then part of what's be just become my habit, not on the podcast, but inside the community is to be like, here's seven masterworks that show how we do this. So we'll be like, yeah. Hey, here's dialogue tag. Like I just did a course on dialogue tags for the community. And it was like, here's how Tony Morrison uses them. Here's how Ernest Hemingway uses them. Here's how TJ Klune is using them. Here's how John Grisham's using them. Here's how Jane Austen used them. Like, so we just go through the gamut of like, here's how all these people use them. And like show like this is the strategies they're using and how they work. And so he was like, Hey, you gotta put all that in the book. 
<laughs> so there is a draft of the book that is like you know 700 pages because <laughs> it's like let's look at all these examples of all these people and i was you know as we were putting it together i was like this isn't actually helpful like this isn't yeah because people just need to digest the concept understand like okay here's how i start to move forward with this problem right and be able to practice it so when i took those out and those happen in the community all the time. They'll tell you that like Jeff is constantly pulling out too many books and like, Hey, look at this one. But yeah, so they, um, those happen in the community, but in the book itself, at the end of each chapter, we have a, uh, I've put in a reading challenge and a writing challenge. So okay. you can like learn the philosophy that kind of, you hear the problem, you learn the philosophy behind like, Hey, here's what we're doing with this piece of dialogue. And here's the like strategic advice. And then we summarize all of it at the end of the chapter. And then I give you like a, hey, if you want to see this in other works, pull out your favorite book and look for this thing. Okay. And then if you want to, if you want to practice writing it, here's a writing challenge that you can go do right now to start kind of strengthening your chops in this. I love so, that. Yeah. Hopefully super practical. For yeah. Everybody. Well, and, and so in, speaking of the, the community that you have, the Dialogue Doctor community, you had mentioned, and I got a note here that you stopped using or you replaced the words hero villain and side character with three yeah other um, words what is language important and why did you do that <laughs> yeah mark i i am so obsessed with language don't ask me if language is important i'll just like <laughs> i'll start rattling off dictionary terms i'll be like okay so here's our um yeah so we were really so one of the problems we found in the community is people were like okay i know i'm supposed to have these themes right like whether i'm writing like romance or horror or whatever i'm supposed to have these like overarching themes that i work on like these topics that kind of you know define the piece and then i'm also supposed my characters are also supposed to grow right and i'm supposed to have like conflict choices and consequences all throughout the piece and it was like how do i do that how do i show character growth how do i develop these themes and so i'd be talking to people about their casts and like because for their, from my perspective when we come to a story the story is an emotional journey that the reader is going on with the characters. And that emotional journey is traveled on through the character interactions. So as the characters interact with each other, we create these emotional moments. The story is a culmination of those emotional moments. And that's not really fully mine. I, I, that I was very inspired by Kurt Vonnegut. He does a, he did a talk and talked about the emotional shape of stories. Um, you can find it on YouTube. It's a great, fantastic talk when i was writing early on i started thinking about like oh my story has an emotional shape and I, I started realizing that like when i read that's what i'm engaging with i'm actually looking for the emotional shape of the story there's and there's i like certain genres i don't like other genres and i realized what i'm saying there is i like specific emotional shapes and there's other emotional shapes i don't like so I don't connect with the emotional shapes that are common in erotica, for example, but I do, or I don't connect with the emotional shapes that are common in sci-fi, but I do connect with the emotional shapes that are common in thriller, right? Like, so when we talk about genre, it's just another way to understand because the reader isn't coming to our book with like, oh my gosh, I love the horror tropes. They're coming to the book with like, oh my gosh, I love how this story, how I engage with the story and how it makes me feel when I read it. Right. So part of our shifting of language is, is sh shifting our mindset to think about the emotional journey we're taking the reader on okay. as opposed to the to the plot points because you can have the right plot points and not have the right emotional journey and the reader will disconnect from the book yeah right because they're there and i think like you know david foster wallace's infinite jest is the is the ultimate proof for this you can have no plot points <laughs> but a powerful emotional journey and readers will read that book forever Right. Like it's that like because the read what we're crafting, we're hoping to craft this story with the right plot points and, and you know, strong characters in order to connect to the reader emotionally. And part of what we've I've been trying to do at the dialogue doctor is bri is create a bridge that's like, hey, if we're trying to connect with the reader emotionally, let's just figure out how these things we use, what they do in those emotions of the reader. Right. So, right. All of that to say, we we got to talking about character growth and themes and these moments of emotional connection between characters. And we realized that, like, okay, we'd be like, well, this the this is the villain of the story, or this is the antagonist of the story, but the antagonist is actually a positive force 
for the hero's change. And this is the hero, but not the hero in the sense that like, it's who I want the reader connecting to, but they're not the good guy. They're just the hero. And as we're talking about the story, I find like, man, we're having to explain every one of these terms. Every time we use it, we're like, you know, caveating around it. We're like, okay, this is the villain, but they're not the villain. They're actually, you know, an ally of the protagonist, but they're not like, or like, this is the protagonist's best friend, but they're actually not the ally. They're actually like the antagonist in some ways because they're going to, and it was just like, okay, this is confusing. So <laughs> we started asking like, what do these characters in the cast do? Right. And we realized like the character that you want the reader to connect to, we call the vehicle okay. because that's the character the reader's right. traveling with. And yeah. most often, the vehicle is the point of view character. Right. Yeah. If you have multiple point of view characters, you have multiple vehicles. Right. Um, if you're doing like third person omniscient, where you're just like, you know, hey, yeah. I'm showing you inside everybody's head, the vehicle character becomes the one that's kind of most relatable. Or, okay. and I find the one that's on the biggest character growth arc. So the one that has the most character growth is going to be your vehicle. So the vehicle character um, is you know and we would often call them the protagonist but again a lot of times your vehicle character can be an antagonist especially if you have an anti-hero type yeah. plot line so that's those caveats again that we're trying to avoid when we talk about character growth so we know that like when we're crafting our character growth we're, we're looking at the vehicle character the vehicle character is going to have some characters that encourage them to be the best version of themselves right we call those their engines because the engine like uh, grooves the character forward. Okay. The vehicle character is going to have some characters that uh, tempt them to be the worst version of themselves. And we call those the anchors because they're wearing, wearing the character down. So if you think about like existing stories, like if uh. you think about like Lord of the Rings, right? Like, and we think about like Frodo's journey in Lord of the Rings. Frodo is going on this growth arc from this hobbit that's like isolated in his shire community to um, marching to Mordor to become like the savior of the world. And the entire time he's struggling with the worst and best versions of himself. The worst versions of himself want to isolate, want to seek self-comfort, and want to drive into um, surrender. Right. on the journey the best versions of himself are self-sacrificial they are full of self-denial and they're moving toward this like uh position as the reluctant hero so he has with him on this journey his engine sam sam is all of those positive qualities i just described sam is what we want frodo to become and sam is constantly calling frodo to be that he also takes on his journey Gollum. Gollum is all of the negative qualities i just described Gollum is his anchor right is sam an ally a protagonist an antagonist he plays all those different roles in the plots there are times where he and frodo are in opposition and you would say like well at this point he's actually frodo's antagonist but sam is always frodo's engine he's always pushing frodo to be the best version of himself right Gollum is always frodo's anchor he's always Hmm. calling for it to be the worst version of himself. And so when we're crafting our character growth arc and we're like, how does our character grow? We're like, okay, well, we need our character to struggle. Well, if you need your character to struggle and to make the wrong decision, put them in scenes with the anchor right. and let the anchor manipulate them in that way. Let them choose to be in the path of the anchor. If they, if you want your character to succeed or you want to have a big emotional moment where your character has to make a positive choice, have your character have chosen the direction of the anchor, behaving like the anchor, and then insert that engine that calls the character to be the better version of themselves. And now you've created this big growth moment where the character has to decide to be the person that they're being called to be. Um, we see this a lot in romance too, like uh, in Bridget Jones' Diary is another great example. Um, and I'm going to use the movie over the book because I think the movie actually does it a lot clearer than the book does. But in the movie, you have Colin Firth, who's the Darcy character, who's the, in the end, the positive love of interest. And then you have Hugh Grant, who's the like kind of slimy, miserable character. And then Bridget is your vehicle, right? Like, and as you're traveling with Bridget, she sets up right at the beginning the decision like, hey... I want to stop doing these behaviors. I want to stop smoking. I want to stop overeating. I want to stop being lethargic all the time. I want to stop cussing so much. And I want to like stop like just being a spaz. And then she says, you know, and I want to start these behaviors. So she sits out right at the beginning, like, I'm going to change. I'm going to write this diary to do it. 
as she moves through, we get her engagement with Daniel, the kind of slimy guy, and Darcy, the the like uptight lawyer. Now, Darcy and Bridget are almost through the entire story an an antagonist to each other. They're cause as it is in Pride and Prejudice too. Bridget views Darcy as her like nemesis, but Darcy's her engine. Whenever she's around Darcy, she behaves in the ways that she laid out at the beginning of the story she wants wow. to behave. So even though Darcy is her antagonist through most of the story and in the end becomes her, you know, love interest, Dar when she's around Darcy, she says exactly what she means to say. She becomes very professional. Her voice modulates to a place where she's like put together. She usually puts down her cigarettes around Darcy, which is an interesting note oh. that the that the author does there and she gains this confidence in speaking to him and she'll say several times throughout the throughout the screenplay um you do this to me getting around you makes me do this when she's around the hugh grant character she's a mess she does all the things she hates she drinks she smokes he's constantly encouraging her to be less than herself she'll like ex she'll express some kind of aspiration and he'll be like come on bridget that's not who you are so he's her anchor like pulling her down and the story mm -hmm. is this unfolding of the engine and the anchor competing for the decisions the vehicle makes as we take this emotional journey on mm -hmm. the, with the vehicle hoping the vehicle will become who we want the vehicle to become in the end right like so it's this the plot line becomes a journey to character growth and the themes start to pour out of the conflicts between the engines and the anchors. But so that, that's just a way to show, like we use these terms as tools. Like I'm not a big fan of just like piling on new terms. Like we've got enough as authors to think about already <laughs> as opposed to all these new terms, but we use these terms as tools in order to empower problems. And so like, if you're having a character growth problem, Put down protagonist, antagonist, hero, and villain, and pick up engine, anchor, and vehicle, and start asking, okay, how is my character going to be at the beginning of the story? How are they going to be at the end of the story? And how do these characters pull them in those directions? Wow. So here, here's the thing that's fascinating, is we're, we're into this really fascinating character journey, how to build this really emotionally resonant you know, storyline and character build. And you're the dialogue doctor, and we haven't even gotten into the mechanics <laughs> of dialogue yet. And that is, so here's the thing that I mean, it, it, and and I'm just observing that I was like, you call yourself the dialogue doctor, but really, I mean, you're really about the so many other aspects of the craft of writing too, right? Dialogue's just one one of those tags <laughs> that we put yeah, on here. And part of me is cheated, Mark. I've I've expanded the definition of dialogue, which is uh oh is it the I dialogue know. and character interaction and it's the character girl? interaction. Yeah. So oh. when we talk about dialogue, we talk yeah. about character interaction. And so okay. for the book talks about you know the mechanics of dialogue. Like I go into the seven components of dialogue and like how dialogue looks on the page. There's a whole bunch in there about dialogue tags. There's like hey if you got X, not how many people are there in your scene and what is that how does that impact what you need to be doing when you're writing that scene so we do get into like the mechanics of dialogue um but we also talk about like here's what a character voice is and here's like how you define a character voice and here's how you can build a character voice so that all your voices don't sound the same and we talk about like hey here's how you start combining cast members in order to create this dynamic character growth we talk about like here's how you modulate a character voice to demonstrate character growth or to demonstrate emotional change in your character right like so it all kind of seeds you have to know this the you have to understand your tools you use to create the words on the page but once you have a grasp of those tools it really expands what you can do with your characterization and your plot and your character and your cast building um yeah. Yeah, so we we I in the community we stretch a lot, but I also in the book I stretch it in that like any the book is a study on how characters interact with each other and how you can manipulate those character interactions to give your reader the experience you want your reader to have. Because the end goal of all of this isn't like craft for craft's sake. I mean, we're indie authors. That's not really what we do. We're wanting to engage readers. So the end of all of this is like, how can we take these tools of craft that writers have been using forever 
define them and then use them to engage more readers in our story. Oh, yeah, perfect, perfect goal when you keep that in mind the whole time. <laughs> there was a mention in 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 the in the sort of correspondence we had as we were talking about your new book about things that you could do or, or, or tricks to help build a character, particularly when, when, when you get stuck as a writer, like what are some of the things that you advise for building a character? Yeah. So building a character, there's two kind of questions there. Cause there's like the individual character where okay. the way that that problem is usually expressed by writers is like, all my characters sound the same and I don't know how to fix it. They all sound like me. Yeah. That's one problem. The other problem is that like, I don't know how to put a cast around my character. Like I have this character, but I don't really know who should fit. Like, what do I need? A lot of times that comes from people that are writing like sci-fi or writing adventure. And they have watched like Guardians of the Galaxy. And they're like, how do I get a Guardians of the Galaxy cast? Like, how do I build that kind of like, you know, that are so popular. That type of cast is so popular right now in modern storytelling that like dynamic type cast that builds off of one another and just creates this energy for the story consumer. So the first one is about understanding how to build a character voice. Character voices real quickly are the external expression of the personality and background. Okay. So you got to know you're like under if you're trapped on like how do I get a how do I get this character to sound different from my other characters go to the character background and ask like what about this character makes this character different okay go to the personality and be like who does this character see themselves as and how do they want to present themselves to the world or how are they presenting themselves to the world are they shy are they you know are they commanding are they curious are they you know, adventurous, are they introverted? Like what give like two adjectives that would describe your character. And then once you have those two adjectives that would describe your character, then ask, how does that sound? Because we are verbal and communal creatures as humans, and there's hardwired into our brains the ability to interpret how people talk and the way people operate in groups. So if you get amongst a group of people and you We'll start watching like you mark your age but you go to conferences and like speak it give incredible conver conversations at conferences you're going to i heard you say on the podcast i'm going to screw up the title book mark con or yep. something book soon yeah oh i got it right <laughs> so you know while you're there you're going to go to the hotel bar and you're going to like meet with five people and when you meet with those five people your brain will start doing all of this work that you're not consciously doing you'll be listening to everybody's voice you'll be understanding like you'll be analyzing the words they use you'll be are they big words or small words are they intellectual words or are they dumb words are they words that express specific emotions all the time you'll be looking at internally you'll be thinking about how they construct sentences you'll be like man is that person's utterance complicated or simple is that person's utterance have a ton of commas in it or does it have do are they always speaking with periods or do they end everything in a question does everything they say end in a question and where do they stick in the m dashes yeah, that's right. Where how and how many M dashes are they using? Yeah. And how many caveats do they have for every and then you'll also be looking at their body language. You'll be looking at like how they take up space, like are their hands in their pockets? Are they big? You know, um, my wife has an Italian family and they're always swinging their arms all around. Like, you know, so how are they like how are they taking up space in the in the in the room? And as you're watching that voice in real time, you will be making decisions about their personality. And our readers do the exact same thing. Right. As they read your character on the page, as they look at how your character just constructs their sentences, as they read the body language you've given your character, as they pay attention to how often your character is participating in a conversation, they are making judgments about your character's personality. The mm. problem when all of our characters sound the same is we haven't taken the step to connect our character's personality to the external expression of their character voice. Right. And we're just hoping and praying that it happens. And so like part of what we did at the dialogue doctor and what's in the book is like, Hey, let's break down what a character voice is so that you can actually have either a pre writing tool where you can be like, okay, just like I define my plot lines, I can define my character voices, or you can have an editing tool. It's like, I'm a pantser. I'm just going to write, but then I can come back 
with this tool that's like, okay, this character is supposed to be shy. This is how a shy voice presents itself. This is how a shy character voice right. sounds. I can go through and be like, okay, at this point, this character says seven sentences in one block, and there's like 10 commas. Shy people don't talk like that. Right. So <laughs> now I have to edit that utterance to actually sound like in my character's voice. Does that make sense? So right, yeah. it's that like, but then when we get to the cast, it's about taking your main characters and lining them up, lining their voices and their personalities up like that two adjective description. I said, lining those up and being like, are these different? Are these diverse in dynamic and how would they interact with each other? So like, if I have a, I mean, I mentioned guardians of the galaxy. So just off the top of my head, like star Lord, I would say is a uh, competent and communal. Right, like he's competent and he's constantly longing for friendships, whereas Rocket is snarky and isolating. Yeah. So you put the two of them in the scene and you've got instant conflict, right? Because Star Lord's looking to bring everybody together and Rocket's constantly pushing everybody away. Yeah. Right. Like, so you've got this kind of like instant chemistry between them to generate conflict. So, and if you line all the characters up that way, right, like you've got Drax who is oblivious and aggressively wrong most of the time you've got gamora who's standoffish and strong you've got nebula who's you know incredibly empathetic and uh very blunt and so you can start to see how like you have these different personalities in your cast you can start creating com combinations of them which just lend to humor and conflict right like if you want two people to hate each other put drax and gamora in a scene yeah if you want people to be connected to one or you want two people to really be drawn together take star lord's like deep desire for community and his confidence and drop it with gamora's strength and um standoffishness and you've got a scene where two characters are being pulled together right like so it's that once we understand and master character voices that we can really start understanding and playing with plot combinations and like using the character interactions to generate the story that we want to tell not just through a book but through a series right like right. i find a lot of the authors in the in over the last two and a half years in the dialogue doctor they get their first book down they end up falling in love with cast members they didn't know that they were going to fall in love with because they fell in love with their character voices and then their next book is like okay how do i bring this cast member more into the center of my next book in the series how do i like drive the series around them and what is their character growth arc so now that i understand their voice and their personality how can that voice grow through the story to become something more than it is you're, you're making me think about a character that was meant to be a cardboard yeah just like a fill-in like a side character like here yeah. it is. yeah and yeah. then the minute she opened her mouth and started speaking i fell in love with her and i wanted to hear what she had to say and yeah. i wanted more of her perspective and and it, it popular uh readers keep saying when's she coming back and i'm yeah. like i'm scared because I don't like, I'm so scared because I, I I built up this this thing for this character, yeah, how much I like her, and I'm like, I don't want to ruin her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's like I don't want you to get to know her because the things that make her like big and wild may actually like be nauseating if I make you read thirty chapters of her. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm curious about about coming back to her, but I do I really want to see her again. But okay, so wow, this is a fantastic conversation, and we are getting close to the end of time. I know this, I'm going to pre-order this the minute I get off this call. And Thanks, this man. is going to be a book that I'm going to love reading. Uh, when is the book coming out? Book will drop in all places. I'm going wide because a mentor I have told me wide for the win. Uh, that's you, by the way. <laughs> I'm going wide. And so the book will drop in all places in paperback and ebook on July 1st. And the audiobook will be sh soon to follow. The audiobook is a little weird in that there's a lot of charts in the book. And it's so gonna be, it's going to be hard to do. Yeah. Are yeah. I wasn't real. Sure. I am. I'm like two okay. thirds of the way through it right now. I wasn't real great at recording those charts. So there are moments. I, I have trouble book. with the lines saying the lines properly. And, uh, you know, like the, in the boxes and the charts. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to describe. We're going to pause the script. I'm just going to describe what's in this chart to you. <laughs> so we'll we'll see how that comes out. Well, that's um, intriguing because you, you have, I mean, the challenge is go to this website and look at a PDF. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'm not going to do that. To like, me. Dude, I'm running while I'm re- listening to your book. I can't. Yeah, I can't <laughs> so like, Describe it to me, Jeff. Describe it to me. Yeah, well, and I will say I've listened to books where they're like, you know, click on this link and go to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm not clicking on it. What are you talking about? I got the audiobook, so I didn't have to touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> so I do do my best just to describe them. There's also a lot that. of dialogue examples in the audiobook. So um, I should not be reading fiction. Uh, so that got a little entertaining as well. So, you know, if you want this, the like to actually digest the book, I'd suggest the ebook or the paperback. Yeah. If you want to laugh at how bad I am at an audiobook narrator, the audiobook will be out shortly after July 1st. And you can. Yeah. You I'll know. have to. I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to get the, the print book so I can mark it up. And um, and then the audiobook just for the ongoing learning uh, to, to re- remind myself. So. I like to ask a question usually at the end is is usually a question for, you know, beginning writers or things you wanted to know, but because I've got the doctor here and, 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 you know, the, what is your equivalent of, you know, an apple a day, right. Is, is, is one of those uh, token uh, phrases oh, or what's question. some sort of apple a day sort of advice that you might give to, to writers. Great question. And can I tie it into a book you wrote? Cause sure. you wrote a book on short fiction with Maddie Darrymple that I thought is absolutely great. Um, uh, in writing short fiction, I can't remember the exact name of it off the top of my head, but taking I was the short tack. Yeah, that's right. Taking the short path. I was um, I was reading it, man. I guess a year ago, I was like, boy, that's they really nail like what short fiction is. So when I started writing for the first year, I wrote a short story every night. Okay, and I was for me. I was dyslexic as a kid. Writing has always been my nemesis growing up. The only class I've ever gotten less than a B in, um, I got a D minus, so just barely passed in uh, freshman composition in college. So it was that. So uh, yeah, I've uh, writing has always was always a struggle for me. And when I fell into it, like nine, ten years ago, specifically writing fiction, I just fell in love. And so I couldn't stop every night before I went to bed. I'd try to crank out like two or 3000 words. And I ended the year with, you know, over 300 short stories. And that was my kind of crucible of learning how scenes work. And so I would recommend, you know, an apple a day, you know, just one scene a day. It doesn't have to be big. Like in the book, I talk about the difference between scenes and segments, scenes being, you know, what we, what we typically write in one sitting is like, Oh, I'm going to write a chapter. A lot of times what we're actually talking about is scenes. It's a moment in the emotional journey segments being components of that moment that are like either based on a single topic or a conversation uh, or sorry, a single topic in the conversation or an emotional moment. I would recommend writing one segment a day. You don't even have to get a full scene. Just write, you know, three characters going back and forth about blank. Even a lot of times when I was first starting, I would literally just overhear something in the world and I'd be like, all right, I'm going to, that's my starting place. (laughs) Two people saying that that's where I'm starting. And then I'm just going to go. And I think really having to construct segments in that way helps us, build kind of our writing chops and helps us understand but yeah so i i just and make sure it's a conversation that's the i recently had one of the members of the community took their work to another editor which is always terrifying when it's like (laughs) you know somebody's been working with you for a year and a half and then they're like i'm going to take this to another editor you're like (laughs) and um one of the things the other editor said was like man this is like 80% 80% dialogue, the, the writing. And they, the, I just happened to know the other editor and they hit me up and they were like, is, is that what you're coaching? I'm like, yeah, we coach screenplay ready novels. So yeah, the, uh, I would recommend when you sit down to write that segment, think of it as I'm writing a conversation. I just right. want, I just want the people talking. That's all yeah. I want. But yeah, so that's, um, you know, I think if you do that every day, I did it every day for a year. I came out on the other end, a uh, beginning writer. I went from zero to beginning writer oh, by doing that. Yeah. So that would be my recommendation of an apple a day. Is, well, thank you. That yeah, was awesome. One segment. Uh, I, I do hope you can come back again because we have so much more to still talk about. But 
In the meantime, just to close, can you please let my listeners know where they can find you online? Yeah, so you can find me at the dialoguedoctor.com. You can get the podcasts there. You can get the there's a weekly newsletter I put out and there's a if you join the community, there's a bonus episode that comes out every week and there are twice a month Zoom calls where you can come and hang out with us like we just did uh we just had a Zoom call this week about um we all read Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, which Man, if you want to look at a book for the craft of dialogue, that Angie Thomas is a master. Oh. So, um, but yeah, we read short stories together. We read books together, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's the best place to find me. I'm on social media kind of on and off, but not really enough to acknowledge that I'm there. Right. Uh, so yeah, maybe someday, but right now that just doesn't happen. But yeah, so dialoguedoctor.com is the best place to come and find me. Awesome. Jeff, thanks again for hanging out with me today. Yeah, Mark, thanks for having me on. So a few of the things that stuck out for me in listening back to this interview with Jeff is is how when we're talking about dialogue, we're really talking about overall character interactions. And that, that was like, boom, gigantic, explosive light bulb uh, in my head when he said that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. It's just there's so much more because it's just, you know, dialogue is one of the many ways that our characters interact, but it's really about character interaction. And then, I mean, again the the concept as well another bam you know explosive moment in my mind was the the emotional journey and, and i went back and i watched the kurt vonnegut video and it, there'll be a link to that in the show notes just absolutely fantastic thinking about that emotional journey and the, and the way jeff put it was just perfect but then also even you know dialogue is a tool you know character tool etc Understanding how your tools, the tools that you use, can help you manipulate the elements of the story to give your readers the emotional journey that they are looking for. And again, as you think about tools, and, and again, I always think about AI as a tool that we can use. Anyone can use the tool, but the author who understands the craft can use the tool and adapt the work of that tool into that emotional journey, which can only come from a human. And then the final reflection is when Jeff mentioned that talking to me back in 2018 was part of an important turning point for him and that he might have given up on writing without that, without that conversation that we had. And, and the reflection there is, wow, I, that is so powerful. And that's why I do this. It's why I do this podcast. It's why I offer a free 20-minute consultation to anyone who wants to be able to just pick my brain and ask me questions. And it does take up a significant amount of time. There is a cost to it. There's a cost to the other things that I have on my plate to get done. But like Jeff, I, I think I really like helping writers. Do I like it more than I like writing? Hmm, I get an intrinsic reward from writing. I do. Just just the writing itself feels good internally. So does helping writers. Helping other writers feels good. Just helping people, I win. And I, and I walk away richer from the experience. And then I walk away richer knowing, you know, I may have had some small impact on people not giving up on their long-term author careers. Because, because you have awesomeness to share with the world. You have something really great that other people can benefit from, whether it's your own experience in writing and publishing and, and, and you know, paying it forward and helping other writers, or the stories you tell, the, the, the nonfiction and, and the fiction stories that you tell that can impact people and make their lives better. And that's kind of a really positive way to end this episode. And I'm speaking positively and the window's open. I'm not sure if you can hear the rain out there. So though it's raining, there is a sun shining in my heart as I finish this reflection. And there will be, there shall always be a rainbow. But until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre thanking you so much for listening to me podcasting in the rain i'm really curious if you can hear the rain in the background but um thank you for listening to 
this episode. Thanks for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. If you want to support the podcast, of course, you've got patreon.com slash starkreflections, but you can also leave a review. And, and seriously, please do leave some reviews for the podcast or share it with a friend or and and leave a review for the podcast and share the podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. So until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing, wonderful post-rain rainbows, and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.